Well, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get into the fourth in this series on wisdom. Lord, thanks for the opportunity to teach and to learn together. We're grateful for your word, for what it does for us, not simply on a practical basis, but for eternity. Help us to remember that the principles here are eternal, and that the absolute uh, connection to us now is practical. And may that be our application constantly, that we might find our source and security in you. Amen. Last week, I uh, was giving uh, synchronized swimming a hard time. If you'll notice on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, there is uh, a group of ladies there who couldn't quite get the same expression on their faces. On the right-hand side, though, I wanted you to see that this was exactly what synchronized swimming is supposed to look like. Everybody's doing the same thing at the same time in the same kind of order. And so my title for all of this is A Place for Everything and Everything in Its Place. The <coughs> essence of uh, what we're after here today, specifically in the area of wisdom, is the concept of order. So the concept of wisdom is the idea of order in the ancient uh, Near Eastern world. Whenever you talked about wisdom in the ancient text, you're talking about something that was focused on the order of the people and the place at, of the time, hence my uh, concept there. Now the picture actually indicates in a visual manner what they actually believed verbally, and that was they believed that they saw all kinds of pieces of life around them, but also understood that there was a puzzle, and that life was whole, and they were looking at how, how to see all of those connections uh, being made in life. So here are just some examples of this. Uh, creation brought about a cosmic order as far as they were concerned in the ancient world. Uh, so they saw in creation the things that they wanted to see uh, overall in an overarching sense from God. Law brought societal order, so there were laws that were necessary. And we see those all the way through uh, First Testament teaching. Etiquette or manners brought relational order. So how do we get along with each other? That would be an important question to ask, and we'll delve into some of that. Government brought political order. Now, whatever you think about government, by the way, was actually instituted by God, and we'll talk about those things here in a moment as well. But it's really important to understand that there is a necessity for structure and order even in politics. So wisdom literally means to pursue and preserve order. That's the essence of what it meant in all of the culture in the ancient world. It's what it means when you read the book of Proverbs. When you see the word wisdom, Think order, because that's the essence of it. Of course, this begs the question and leaves us wondering, well, where does this order come from, and what is the foundation of this order? Hence, the emphasis in the book of Proverbs. So let's take these one at a time. First of all, creation preserves order. And this is against chaos. We have talked about chaos earlier in one of the uh, sessions that we had earlier. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that evolution does not promote order. In fact, if we really truly uh, practiced and applied an evolutionary view of life and things, we would see things as very chaotic. We would expect tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes on a regular basis. This would be normal for us. Uh, obviously, we don't see those kinds of things all the time. Uh, this might be a throwback for most of us to junior high school, but The Call of the Wild uh, literally is an evolutionary treatise uh, written by Jack London. Jack London was an evolutionist. He was also a Marxist-Leninist. Those kinds of things go together. So Jack London wrote Call of the Wild, and these are the phrases that came out of that book. We still use them today, over a century later, but here they are. Red in tooth and claw, and dog eat dog world. Both those phrases came from Jack London's book, Call of the Wild. Now what fascinates me about this is that we don't think about Call of the Wild as an evolutionary book. It is indeed that way exactly, and that's what Jack London uh, anticipated and expected and intended by his book. But creation preserves order against the chaos. Now, if you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, I emphasized this, and I had asked my students in one of my classes, what differences do you see between Genesis and Babylonian myths? And I identified some of the ideas that they suggested. The first and most obvious one is that there is chaos in the Babylonian myths versus order in Genesis. There are gods in the Babylonian myths and one god in Genesis, and ultimately gods are made in human image in Babylonian myths, but humans are made in God's image. So when you're reading the book of Proverbs, understand that this whole thing is flipped upside down. 
While everybody wants order, order really only can come from one place. And the idea behind that, of course, is that you can only find it there, and hence our emphasis in the book of Proverbs, and specifically in God's Word. So here's an example of somebody in our current culture who believes in evolutionary thought. His name is Steven Pinker. He's a very famous um, and, and evolutionary biologist, and he admits that believing in right and wrong is nothing more than an impersonal computer program, which is very hard to practice with his family when he gets home at night. See, you see the problem with this, is once you believe these things, then to actually uh, practice them in real life is very, very difficult. So if you believe in a chaos, if you believe that right and wrong is simply a flip of the coin, or really left up to the individual, do you, can you really live like that when you go home and see your wife and children? And this is a problem, of course, for those who actually believe these kinds of things, uh, that they can't actually practice what they uh, preach in that sense of thing. Another example of this is that law preserves order. This is against societal breakdown. Uh, I think this is an important idea when you think about uh, the concept of whatever I want. Uh, whatever I want is really a focus on disorder. It has absolutely no focus on the whole of anything. It's really just focused on the piece, namely me. The focus is only on myself. And so when we talk about societal breakdown or when we see uh, problems in our culture, really what we ought to be doing is looking in the mirror and saying, the problem starts here with me. I would like to talk about zombies. Now, I know that this is going to uh, cause some of you a bit of consternation, but I think it's important to understand that all of the zombie movies and The Walking Dead and all of those kinds of things that we see on a regular basis in our culture are premised on this concept of societal breakdown. But it's not the idea that we think it is. Zombies are really not about flesh-eating monsters. It's really about us. And so here is uh, Kim Paffenroth. Uh, for those of you who were in the movie sessions a few years back when I taught that, uh, he wrote a book called Gospel of the Living Dead, where he said the good news in zombie movies is that sin is real. It can be good news if that helps us realize through God's grace we can turn away from sin. Zombie movies show that there will be hell to pay if we don't change our ways. Amen. And that's the essence of what it means to be in a zombie flick. So if, if you at all are following The Walking Dead, uh, The Walking Dead is a really important, powerful, cultural statement, which literally is giving us opportunity to share the gospel with people. And the reason I say that is because the whole show is not about the dead, it's about the living and how the living treat each other. So when you think about this, think about uh, Paffinoroff's comments about Dante's Inferno. He said this, While the undead cannot control their passions, it's the living who sink into the lower circles of damnation. Speaking again of Dante's Inferno. Choosing to wallow in hate, pride, deceit, viciousness, greed, cruelty, and other complex, twisted forms of sin, in these bloody morality tales, it is the living who pervert the reason to attack others. Zombies is not about the blood and the gore. It's about human beings who cannot function properly because they are dealing with the issues of sin. One more comment about this. Racism, sexism, materialism, consumerism, scientism, individualism afflict American society and infect the church. Zombies may be flesh eaters, but our ethical choices show us to be soul eaters. And so that's my contention that the emphasis in zombie films, we talk about societal breakdown, and you can point to any uh, newspaper page that you want to, uh, the emphasis is that the problem starts here with us. Manners preserve relational order. This is against rudeness. Now this might come as a real shock, or at least an interesting uh, divergence from zombies. Now we're going to automatically talk about manners. But when you think about the book of Proverbs, think about these things. What does Proverbs talk about? It talks about the essence of creation. We, we talked about that versus an evolutionary chaos. Uh, we saw the idea that all of these isms pose real problems for us and that we are the real issues. And then there are lots of things in Proverbs about relationships. And so what are the key components of relationships? Well, here are a few. Appropriateness, decorum, propriety, dignity, tact, restraint, respectability, and etiquette. We all practice these on a regular basis, don't we? I'm trying to shove my tongue in my cheek as far as it will go here. Uh, we really have problems with this, and here's the reason why, in two words. Social media. 
Social media does not lend itself to decorum, to tact, to dignity, to restraint. It lends itself to <laughs> everything's wide open for anybody to say. So when we think about the issue of relational order and how we're supposed to treat each other, Proverbs actually gives us the basis for that. And it gives us a very different uh, view than social media. William Wilberforce, who was probably most well known for uh, being an Englishman who attempted to, and finally did it toward the end of his life, see the end of slavery in England after 30 plus years of doing this in the House of Commons, was probably not so well known for his book on manners. But to him, his book on manners was just as important as his fight against slavery in the 1800s. He wrote a book on English manners, and he said that as far as he was concerned, that the problems that we face in the culture because of our own sinfulness comes from our lack of manners toward each other, the relational connections. Again, all of this goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. How are we supposed to treat each other? Uh, we're actually supposed to love each other and care for each other uh, no matter what. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a movie uh, specifically. Uh, to me, uh, Robin and I talk about this all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this happens at our house as well as talking about second graders saying please and thank you. But here it is, a lack of gratitude and the coarsening of culture. For those of you who know uh, Tommy Lee Jones, you know that this is a snapshot photo uh, from the movie No Country for Old Men, where in one of the scenes there were two sheriffs discussing culture. And Tommy Lee says, I think once you stop hearing sir and ma'am, the rest is soon to follow. It is the dismal tide. It is not the one thing. When you begin to hear people not being grateful for something, or they're not reflecting properly on how they treat other people, it is an antithesis, it's against what Proverbs teaches about how we should get along with each other, how should we care for each other, how should we reach out to each other and be generous toward each other. So the idea of uh, creational order, relational order, all of these things go together and we find our <coughs> emphasis in Proverbs. Government preserves political order, and this is against anarchy. So whatever you think about this building and the people who uh, practice what they do there, uh, nonetheless, terrorism does not promote order. It's one of the things that drives us nuts as Americans because we hate disorder. We don't really think about it this way. But the essence of wisdom it being order, we do not like disorder, and terrorism is exactly the opposite of order. Well, what does God's Word say? Genesis 9 says that government was actually instituted by God. Well, we shouldn't be surprised by this. Actually, we should revel in it and understand our responsibility to it as free people uh, to actually participate in our own political processes. But then to be wary, as 1 Samuel says, we want a king like all the other nations. So here are the Israelites, who have obviously a great political system already in place. Uh, they basically thumb their nose at God and say, we want what everybody else wants. Be wary of that in our own culture, that we don't go after the thing that the culture wants itself, but understand that we bear responsibility to be distinctive from it. If you want, if you want to learn anything at all about how we should function in government and how we should think about government, read Proverbs 28-29 over and over and over again, very pronounced statements about how we should be. <laughs> Against terrorism, here is the great line, some men aren't looking for anything logical like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. So when we think about order, we don't think about anarchy. We don't want terrorism. Uh, we want somebody to actually preserve the order, and of course all of this uh, from the basis of Proverbs. Wisdom is the pursuit and the preservation of order against mutiny. Now, mutiny happens on a ship. For those of you who are not quite sure about that word, uh, it actually takes place when a captain uh, gives certain orders and the shipmates don't like it and they overthrow the captain's authority. Uh, this is uh, obviously against what Proverbs suggests to us. And let me give you an example of this with my students. Uh, since the beginning of the year, and I'm speaking now about high school students, well, this would also apply to my Ph.D. students, I think, too, as well. Um, but all of my students hate it when I correct their grammar. Every single one of them does. Uh, and they say, why can't I say it like this? And I, I will tell, emphasize to them that there needs to be some kind of general order to how they write, and they have to write in a certain way, and we've given all of these prescriptions, and I've wasted all this ink on your paper. 
all of these things. People can't stand it when I correct their grammar. Nor can we stand it when we are told we are wrong. So the problem, of course, is our own again. Yeah, there needs to be kind of a standard so that my students know that there's a grammatical uh, basis for how we're going to write, uh, but really the issue is uh, my own. The real issue starts within me and that I really hate to be told that I'm wrong and don't think that I am or whatever the case might be. So when we think about order, we think about things like uh, the issue of a mutiny on a ship, for instance. Uh, Master and Commander is a good example of this. Russell Crowe plays the commander of a ship and has to keep ordering on it. Then there are those who actually follow Robert's rules of order. I suspect there are those still some of those things around and some people who actually follow those. Uh, I think actually the Congress does. And then uh, law and order. So we have these kinds of concepts that run all the way through our culture and we see these things as good. The question always is, where did they come from? And what's the basis for them? And why should I abide by or accede to these kinds of ideas? Well, again, coming back to what we started with, wisdom equals order in both ancient and modern worlds. Nothing has changed. Just as an aside, I really get cranky when people start telling me that this is an old book and it doesn't apply anymore and that somehow uh, things have changed. Nothing has changed. Genesis 3, I am still the same sinful person as Adam might have been in, Gen in Romans chapter 5 tells us. So uh, the problem uh, is one that is continuous for us. And sometimes we get the idea that because we call this the Old Testament, that it's outdated. It's not. It relates to the real world and the culture in which we live. The worldview, which has a coherent, cohesive, or overarching, creational, sustaining order, that's what people want. People want order, so the essence of what it means to read and live Proverbs is the essence of order. In the ancient world, wisdom was understood to be that order, and ancient and modern people alike like it when everything fits together. That should come as no real shock when we look at the university, because the word university itself actually comes from these words. University, the one and the many. How do the one and the many fit together? How do all things fit together? So if you have attended university, you're going to university, you know other people that are in a university, this is the essence of what that word actually meant. How do we see the whole world as a cohesive whole, and the whole point behind education is preparing students for wisdom, living a whole life, again, that holistic concept. So order in the cosmos only becomes there because there is an orderer, there is someone in charge of all of this. We assume order when we say things like this. Pick up the house. Make your bed. Put things away. Straighten up. Get things in order. Clean your room. Every single time we make comments such as this, we are depending upon a standard that we can't touch. We can't see order, but we know that it must be there. And it has to be. And especially we want to see it in our children's bedrooms. So that's essentially uh, what we're concerned about. But the whole concept of order, cleaning your room, for instance, comes and grows out of the book of Proverbs and the wisdom concept. So order understood because of the one who brings it. So if order comes from an orderer, we have to identify who that is. And obviously for us, the fear of the Lord is going to be the crucial component to this. And on your handouts today, on the first page toward the bottom of this, I'm not going to read all of this section, uh, but do take a copy of this. Uh, you'll notice probably that I kind of co-opted this from other things that I've written in the past. But this will give you a really good snapshot of what it means uh, when we talk about uh, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord has, uh, have, has about eight different meanings in First Testament teaching. But the real focus that we want to emphasize in this particular section has to do with relationship. I give this example of the keystone... Uh, because the Keystone Arch, to me, is a really great example of what it means to live life in tension. So when I think about living life in tension and the fear of the Lord, the one thing that holds that arch together is the Keystone. And the Keystone, to me, is this picture of who Jesus is, that he's holding this whole thing together, that the whole earth and the whole world uh, is based on a meaningful, enjoyable life, because that's what Proverbs intends for us, an ordered, right relationship with him. And that's really crucial, and that's the essence of what it means to be a proverbial Christian in this world. 
So when we take this very famous line, this is Proverbs 1, 7. Everybody knows this. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So what does the beginning mean? Well, the beginning is not the chief or the sum of something. It literally is the start or the inception of where we start with our ethics or our rightness. So the very first step in correct living is our relationship with God, hence the keystone. So if you want to live proverbially, proverb, proverbially, yes, proverbially good lives, then in that sense of things, we want to begin with the one who has given this order to us, this wisdom to us, who is the Lord Yahweh, the God of First and Second Testaments. The problem, of course, in our culture is that everybody wants a Yoda. Now, we try to sidestep the fear of the Lord in this culture by trying to find somebody else that's going to fill that bill for us. So here's what we we're meaning here. Understanding God's requirements and expectations preserves order. We really like order. We just don't want to bow the knee to this God who has given us all things. And so wisdom transcends this basic knowledge or skill of any discipline. We're really interested in making sure that we got a handle on these things. It doesn't really matter to us from whom this comes. And so what is everybody looking for? People want a Yoda, a mentor, a wise man, a rabbi. Everybody's looking for somebody to take care of these issues. We want to elect them into office. We want to make sure that we hire the right administration, whatever the case might be. And we do this because we want somebody to be in charge. We don't necessarily want the one who has made the order in the world, but we want somebody, and we have to look at somebody uh, to be that person. So let's fast forward to Jesus. One of Jesus' very famous lines, he said, Take my yoke upon you, because it's easy, it's light, he said. What does that relate to anything that I've just been saying for the last 20 minutes? Well, in Jesus' time, the yoke literally referred to a rabbi's teaching. Now, the yoke was literally the interpretation of the law. So, the rabbis, whoever they might be, would pick out their hundreds of rituals or their hundreds of interpretations that were really important for them, and that would be what you would follow. You would follow that rabbi because you really liked that interpretation, that analysis, that direction that they were going in life. But as soon as you did that, you've got to follow all these hundreds of laws. Well, when Jesus says this, he says, other guys, their yokes are heavy because they're adding all this stuff. But I'm telling you, mine's light. And the reason mine is light is because I'm telling you two things. Love God and love people. That's the essence of what it means. To live relationally, properly, proverbially in the world that God has given us uh, is to love God and to love people. And that's what we find all the way through the book of Proverbs. Now, for many, many years, I've been teaching my students what I refer to as the spud test. And this is uh, actually on the back of your pages, if you're so inclined. I've given you most everything that I've written uh, on that, at least in a general overview of this. But I wanted to run through the questions that I've asked here on the back side of that handout. The SPUD test, sensible, practical, universal, and dependable. So is the belief sensible to what is? Whatever it is that you're believing, is it prudent and logical? Or is the worldview based on emotion, experience, or desire? Is the thinking true to life, or do you respond, oh, come on? <laughs> I mean, how often do we say stuff, but come on, you got to be kidding me, man. That's the essence of what it, the, the exact opposite of sensible. The second one is the belief practical and workable in everyday life. Can people live this way? Or when applied to reality, is the worldview useless and unbeneficial? Three, is the belief universal for all people, all places, all times? Does the worldview produce a help for people throughout history? Or are people hurt by the ethics of this viewpoint? And four, is the belief dependable and consistent? Are the ideas based on a changeless set of standards? Or are they based on the whim of human decision? So when I think about helping uh, people to think differently from Proverbs, but all, all of life, I think about the spud test. Is it sensible, is it practical, universal, and dependable? Are these uh, essential qualities that we find uh, throughout the scriptures uh, something that we see in whatever situation we're in, whatever relationship, whatever category, whatever institution, fill in the blank. Now the exact opposite of this is what I refer to as the crud test. This is where the foolish person brings disorder by their behavior or thinking. Let me enumerate the crud for you. The C is the word for conceived. Uh, conceited. 
Uh, we are conceited when we think this is all about us. So the crud really begins with how bad are we, and we really don't see it, uh, but we think it's all about us. The second is about rebellion. We really don't like laws, we don't like frameworks, we don't like boundaries at all, and so we're quite rebellious. We are also undisciplined. We don't want to see ourselves as responsible to any kind of uh, understanding of how we ought to live life in any way that suggests order. And then finally, we are damaging to others. The things that we do don't help people, they actually end up hurting other people. So you can choose the spud test, you can choose the crud test, whichever one you want. But the bottom line is, one is antithetic to the other, and the spud test actually suggests something that comes out of the book of Proverbs. What is all of this based upon? All of this is based upon that famous line, the fear of the Lord. I've suggested here that courage is knowing what to fear. One of my favorite little lines in uh, the Bible, it comes right out of Exodus chapter 20, right after God gives the Ten Commandments to the people. Moses says to the people, God through Moses says to the people, don't be afraid. <laughs> well, wait a second. Man, you got thunder, lightning, you know, this awful, horrendous harangue going on all around us. You tell us not to be afraid. And then he turns around and says, but fear. Don't be afraid, but fear. Grace has taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. I've always thought that if there was one line in hymnology that is closest to the biblical text, it's that one. That grace has taught my heart to fear, but... Grace has also relieved those fears. And we find that in Exodus chapter 20. We also see this in places like, well, the end of Deuteronomy, where the, the law code is, is ending, and we now are into the book of Joshua. Over and over and over again in the first uh, chapter of Joshua, we find these lines. Be strong and courageous. What does courage mean? To know what to fear. Be strong and courageous. Don't fear them. Fear him. Remember what Jesus said? Don't fear him who can simply kill the body. Fear him who can kill both body and soul, Matthew chapter 10. So we're really concerned, ultimately, to know who to fear. The essence of all of what I've just explained this morning about the concept of order coming out of wisdom is based on who is the orderer. Who's the one to whom we must give an account? Whom should we fear? So... For us, the one who does not fear the Lord tries to find order in something or someone else, usually in themselves. And this is the crud people, you know, the people who literally think in their own conceit, in their own rebellious nature, their undisciplined selves, damaging uh, what they do to others. Uh, this is uh, how they respond, generally speaking. But for those who do fear the Lord, we rest in a consistency found in the personal, eternal, triune creator of the universe. And this fear is has multiple ideas to it, but the essence of it is, are we in this personal relationship with the one who has made us? Are we in order of the orderer? Are we practicing the order that he has given us to live? As always, there are five questions at the end. I've listed these on the back side of that handout as well. Here are just some things to consider, and we can pursue them if you'd like, or if you have other questions, feel free. How should we rethink our explanation of fear to young people. How do we teach our children what fear is? Does this emphasis on the fear of the Lord give us any direction? Does the fear of the Lord compel our thinking, our confession, or our desire? Before we think something, before we do something, are we thinking about the fear of the Lord? How do we explain words like sensible and dependable to our non-Christian friends? Where does sensible and dependable come from unless there's a standard for which we can say this is dependable? And this makes sense. Number four, when do we commit the reading of Proverbs to our daily schedule? There are 31 chapters, uh, generally speaking, 30, 31 days in our calendars for each month. And how has wisdom caused us to listen, respond, support, relinquish, examine, avoid, or resolve anything in our lives? How has it impacted how we are on the inside? Thoughts, comments? immediately something that a light came on when you were talking about the walking dead um, not not to ruin it for anybody that's not seen it but what's revealed in the first season is that this virus or whatever the, the malady is it's 
already in them. It, it, it draws a distinct, uh, a clear analogy to the concept of original sin. Without having done anything to acquire the virus, people that haven't been bitten or scratched or whatever, they, they already have it. So when they die, that they reanimate as this horrible thing, and that really walks in with the gospel message because that concept is offensive to believers and non-believers alike. I've not done anything wrong. Why am I a sinner? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, the essence, I'm telling you, there's so much, so many good things that come out of movies and television today that give us great opportunities for the gospel. And this is a powerful one. I mean, it is so pronounced in our culture, one that we should take advantage of. So thanks for emphasizing that. One of the biggest things I've learned in my life, and I keep learning, <coughs> is when we talk about fear. Uh, you don't live on the streets and everything and not know how to have fear. Because you have to trust what God does at all times. Because you never know when the next beating is going to be. And since it is illegal to be homeless, um, it's very hard to find places to sleep, and then you got to trust the people that you're around because look, they'll steal, but they'll take everything from you off your back. That phrase that you use there, you never know, uh, really hits home here. This concept of uh, what it means to fear God means that sometimes you live in a state where you just don't know what's going to happen. I tell people this all the time. It's a lot easier to teach sovereignty than it is to live it. And so it is, I think, generally speaking about wisdom. Uh, when bad stuff happens to us, you know, it's really hard because we got to live it. we got to live through that moment. And like Bob says, you just never know sometimes. It's really hard. Other questions, comments? When I think about uh, that term, fear of the Lord, um, I would tend to explain it as a, a reference or respect, as opposed to uh, the adrenaline rush we experience when we're afraid of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the emphasis on awe and respect certainly fits into that. It's a multifaceted concept. It's a really, really fascinating phrase. A comment about the rule of law. Um, the, the the rule of law is is orderly, and the rule of man isn't. God. God gave Israel a civil government that was a rule of law. And they they chose to get a king. And that meant they were turning to the rule of man. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Reformation saw a, re, a return <clears throat> to the rule of law. That was a big deal during the Reformation, was to, to for, for the law to become the king instead of the king being the law. Mm -hmm. Um, and today, we're in the process of abandoning the rule of law, uh, and, and each part of our civil government is attempting to uh, assert and rule according to what the individuals in power want to have happen, rather than the rule of law. It's like you're a lawyer or something. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, uh, this is your, uh, your vocation. Uh, when I think about this, you mentioned the Reformation, the famous line is, Lex Rex, the law is supposed to be king. But of course, even we see it around us all the time that Rex Lex, the, the king, is the law, and that's the unfortunate part about it, uh, if indeed that's uh, the direction of this country, but certainly we've seen it uh, throughout all of history, uh, that the idea that law is no longer in a, um, in a wisdom that's established by a transcendent order of God. If you don't have that any longer, if that is not being not only maintained, but sustained, and then we see that going forward as important, uh, then there will be no basis for anything outside of the whim of individual uh, jurists or lawmakers or executives in the executive branch. I mean, we see this all the time. So the necessity of wisdom gives us this concept of law and order. And the real importance of this is that we live our lives based on this. We're going to get out of this class right now, those of us who went to first service, we're going to stick a key in the ignition, turn it over, and we're going to expect this motor to start. Guess what? That's order. When we go down the street and see a stop sign, we stop. Why? Because that's order. 
All of our lives are based on this. Well, my question to everybody is going to be the same. Where did that come from? Who says? Why should I? Who are you to tell me? Who made you my daddy? <laughs> and that's the great question. And that's the one we need to engage with other people. So think about this. Think about how wisdom and order can, of necessity, drive the gospel message for us. And think about how we can communicate that in a world that desperately needs it and doesn't want to have it. Thanks for being here today. Grateful for your time.